Um, I think we'd better move on to the last talk, um, not least because I'm sure everyone uh, wants to go to the bar, um, if we can judge by previous nights. Um, so let me please introduce my friend Peter Fedichev, who um, uh, uh, has been um, highlighted in relation to me recently because he and I had a two-hour intense conversation in Montenegro a couple of months ago that was videoed and talked about all over social media and everything. So, um, Peter, go ahead. Oh, um, what is the... Oh, okay. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, too much light, I don't see anyone, <laughs> actually. Well, thank you very much for the, you are still here. This is the last talk. It's a big honor and huge responsibility, as they say in my country. Um, I think uh, it's, it's important maybe to start with the question. Like, uh, we have lots of uh, medical technologies that are going into clinical trials, even these days. Some of them have been in humans. But uh, could you raise your hand if you believe that uh, any of them could, let's say, double human lifespan? I mean, any of the interventions that we have now in clinical trials. Well, I think it's an important question because if something is going into clinical trials right now, it will be probably approved in five years. I mean, I'm an optimist here, which means that it will end up in sick people first and then it will go to reasonably healthy people within another five years, which means that if somebody is thinking about his personal horizon, uh, we should be more aggressive on things that should have uh, stronger effects. So that's why my interest for more than 10 years is the biology or physics or whatever, the science uh, over the mortality acceleration. So which factors let certain species live very long without showing signs of, let's call it, demographic mortality, and which uh, or why certain species like humans have very uh, large acceleration of mortality. Um, just for fun, because everyone has seen those log plots for mortality, I uh, brought the picture from... Uh, um, from a nature paper, uh, not, not ours. This is the actual acceleration of mortality on the left uh, in humans. So in humans, uh, chances to die double every eight years. And then we have those naked mole rats and other negligibly senescent species. We've, we've had just wonderful presentations uh, today in the morning for those who were awake. And uh, for those guys, you can see it, this is not log plot again. So you can see that for those guys in large groups, you don't have, I mean, the mortality stays the same as we age. So the question is actually, can we, can we understand, uh, how can we understand why certain animals demonstrate, I mean, where is, where is, what is biologically this mortality rate doubling time? How it's encoded, how it is stored? So we're approaching this from, uh, I mean, with the tools and with the, uh, with the science uh, coming from physical and engineering sciences. So I came here more than 10 years ago with the idea that, okay, if I have the exponents aware exponential acceleration of mortality, uh, most probably I should have somewhere an in exponential instability. That's uh, simple things like viral infections, uh, nuclear explosions, and many sciences, in many branches of sciences. You have examples where you have, let's say, one thing, one particle, one error, that one virus particle that is going into the system starts creating more particles. And if you don't clear, clear them out, you have an exponential acceleration in the total number of particles. The reactor is becoming critical and you have a nuclear explosion. So the simpler idea was that uh, mice are presumably exponentially exploding like unstable species. Naked mole rats are probably stable and then the idea was to find out where humans are on this scale. So let's say the uh, Jira, our company version uh, 1.0, was the idea is to take uh, unstable humans, do something pharmacologically, make them stable, stable and live, well, if not forever, then for a few hundred years. So the idea was to go there uh, to, to address this problem with lots of data. And uh, as I will show you in a moment, uh, suddenly humans are the most uh, studied animals on Earth. We have so many, so much electronic medical records, so much genetics. I mean, no lab animal can actually compare in terms of the data available. So we started with small data sets like 50,000 mice, all longitudinal. I mean, whatever we are doing is longitudinal, which means that we're studying trajectories, and I will show you some results. And then we published a bunch of papers, get some uh, reputation, got accepted to UK Biobank, and then this year we got a collaboration with Pfizer, which brought our total data set to more than 10 million electronic medical records, which I think is sufficiently large data set to start actually trusting uh, to, 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 the, to the results uh, that we are getting there. 
So we got some attention with the results that we are publishing and uh, many people perceive them in negative sense, like we are saying that certain things cannot be, certain things cannot be again. But I think it's important, like in engineering sciences, you don't do things that are not allowed to, to work. And uh, what I hope to demonstrate to you is that the outcome is pretty positive. We should be able, using all that amounts of data, to triage the technologies and the approaches that uh, most probably work. So what do we do? As I said, we take trajectories and we're trying to do what I think people would be doing uh, or maybe AI would be doing next time when you see a trajectory of a planet, for example. We're trying to see how the planet is moving around uh, a star and try to detect, to infer the trajectory, the equation of motion, really to predict the future state from the current state. So, for example, with mice, we take a bunch of blood analysis, we compress them into a few numbers, and then we use those numbers to predict the future state of a mouse within a few months from now. We're running these uh, neural networks along uh, lots of data, along trajectories, aging trajectories of individual mice, and then we interrogate the system and try to understand how many variables are actually required to describe aging in mice. And the funny thing is that in mice you need just one variable. And that variable, I mean, this is what is called unsupervised learning. You don't care what is the specific functional independence. You don't fit, uh, you know, straight lines on the data. You just see what is in there. And the interesting thing is that that only number that is required to describe aging in mice, whatever is, the, whatever is this, is actually going up exponentially in mice. So this is the actual data from Andrei Gutkov's lab uh, from his mice. This is a validation study. And you can see that it's going up more than linearly, faster than linearly. If you fit the exponent, the exponent is exactly as the mortality rate doubling time. And some other mathematical features of the model, you know, quickly tell you that this is an exponentially unstable animal. Essentially, it means that if you make, put an error into a mouse, I mean, take out a few molecules from somewhere, this error gets accumulated uh, exponentially. And uh, as you can see on that graph, there are these red dots. The red dots are animals of all ages that are scheduled to be killed because they are too sick in the lab. You can see that in the lab, mice literally die of advanced biological age. Whenever they reach a certain level of whatever biological age, they are dead because they are too sick. So I, I think this is a good metaphor. You really have the exponential accumulation of something. You can measure it, and uh, it's going up exponentially. And when you hit the wall, you are dead. So pretty simple stuff. As I said, the most surprising fact here was that there is just one number that is sufficient to describe these things. So we use blood cell counts in order to train the model, but then if we, if we correlate, uh, for, the, for example, senescent cell burden in these animals as a function of age or as a function of our inferred quantity, this dynamic frailty index, we can see that there is a, a lot more correlation to our frailty index than to chronological age. I mean, this is really the clock. What we're getting here is the clock. All the hallmarks of aging are actually adjusted to, to this clock. And there is a good theoretical reason for that, but who cares about theories? So exponential instability sounds scary, but there is an interesting uh, consequence of instability. The instability means that the system doesn't know where the equilibrium state is, which means that if you reduce damage from this animal, the damage will get accumulated again at the same rate, but now from the lower base which means that you should be able to do rejuvenation in mice. And as we all know, it's quite possible. So in mice, when you do short treatments with interventions that extend lifespan, the effect of the interventions should stay forever, as it is shown here. And by the way, that's how exactly it works in practice. So when we take, let's say, a control and future treated group on the left of the same biological age, according to our calculations, and then we administer, in this case, two shots of experimental treatment, no treatment after that, and you can see that the treated group has, is never catching up with the control, right? That's what instability means. It's interesting, I mean, we always think about instability as something bad, but in this particular example, it means that the system doesn't know where to relax to, right? There is no equilibrium state. Which means that uh, with short treatments in mice, you produce something that looks like rejuvenation, and that's another example that we've done with uh, Brian Kennedy uh, in his lab. So you have the, on the left the survival curve, uh, up to 100%. The horizontal axis on the left is the uh, time since the beginning of the exper experiment. These are geriatric mice, so these are 100 weeks old mice. They are dying from natural causes, the dashed line. And then you have rapamycin, which is a positive control that works in mice that is treated for a longer time. And then you have just one shot of experimental intervention. And then you can see that there is a mortality delay. And what's most interesting is that when you measure hallmarks of aging, like senescent cell burden in presumably immune system, 
uh, you can see that two months after the treatment where there is no drug in circulation, you still see the effect of the drug. So as I said, there is no equilibrium position. Whatever you do, you end up with having an uh, effect a uh, long time in the future. So, okay, it looks like, I mean, and that, that's what many people are pitching to everybody else, like, you know, we have rejuvenation in mice, which means that we will have lots of rejuvenation in humans. I mean, that's how the narrative uh, often goes. So what happens if we apply the same mo models to humans? And as I said, we have lots more data on humans. So typically, uh, if you have some parameter, like the dashed line here is, for example, the body weight in humans. This is the cross-section data average over the large data set. There are, there are no straight lines, <laughs> there are no blocks, and there are no exponents. So no individual parameter in human body depends exponentially on time with the right exponent. I mean, nothing is doubling uh, with the exponent, eight, doubling in eight years of your life. So in humans, the growth and aging is nicely separated. So the left part of this curve is described in this wonderful book, Scale by Jeffrey West, that I highly recommend, and in his One Science and One Nature paper, so I'm not going uh, into that. So on the right, you see something that looks like aging, and that something that looks like aging never, is never exponential. This is very bad, by the way, because in mice, as I have just shown to you, you can measure lots of things that are exponential with age. So you act against them, and you reduce mortality. In humans, we have exponential mortality and no exponential changes. What's the, I don't know, forgot the world. So if this thing doesn't go up exponentially, what does it do? I mean, these measures of biological age in humans, what do they do? So I think that our friends from glycan age could confirm that if you start measuring glycan age or any other biological age over time, you would see that the measurements are not the same. <laughs> they fluctuate. You sleep more, as they say, uh, your biological age is going down, you sleep less, it's going up. So it's fluctuating all the time because life is hitting you with all kinds of adverse events. So what happens is that if I measure the biological age now, and then in one minute, most probably I will have the same measurement. <laughs> but if I measure it within a few weeks, the correlations between the measurements will go down because our body relaxes to the equilibrium state. So what we measured here with different signals is that we measure on the left, we measure the rate, how quickly, the rate, how quickly is our biological age relaxes to the equilibrium position. And you can see that the rate is going down with the, with the age. And it doesn't matter what kind of biological age you are using. We used here two biological ages. One is like pheno age from blood, and the other is uh, from variable uh, activity. You can see that as you age, on average, it gets, the recovery rate is going down, it, it's getting longer and longer for you to get back to the equilibrium position. Which means that if you are at about 100, 120 years old, as you can see, the rate is going to zero, which means that you are not able to recover. That pretty much looks like the maximum lifespan. You may ask me if it's an academical thing. I mean, what, what is this, this out correlation time of uh, biological age? It's not, because if instead of the recovery rate of biological age, I would plot on the right another, you know, legally uh, useful measure of recovery rate, the hospital stay, right? You see the inverse hospital rate, which, uh, sorry, the inverse hospital stay, which is your recovery rate, right? It's going down linearly with age and it hits zero at about the same 120 years old. So really there is a quantity, which is the dynamic property of the biological age. It's not the level of your biological age what counts here. It's the ability of your biological age to recover. And this is a very strongly age dependent quantity, which actually I will show you in a moment, tells you how, go how long I'm going to live. Well, the property of this loss of recovery ability with age is universal. So you can see it many biological age measures, which you can observe longitudinally. So when it takes longer for you to recover, it means that if your life hit you in, some, in such a way that your biological age goes to stratosphere, if it takes longer to recover, you will go back slower, which means that on average you have more fluctuations in your biological age. So if I plot here the inverse variance of different biological ages, my biological ages, other people's biological ages, on the left, you see the inverse variance. So basically when this thing hits zero, the variance is becoming infinite, right? So the organism loses the ability to control its state. You can see that no matter which biological age you are using in humans, the fluctuations of uh, organism state become infinite at about the same 120 years old. Essentially, it means that even if you don't have diseases, which is by 120 years old is, you know, remarkable, you will not be able to recover even from small stresses. So this thing is telling you that in physiological measurements, which you are taking from any measurements, from variable activity, I will show the methylation clock, it's the same. In all kinds of measurements, you see the evidence of maximum human lifespan. 
which is driven by something else than fluctuations of biological age. This thing, this maximum human lifespan, is not affected by things that are affecting biological age. So how you can actually visualize what's going on? I mean, what's, what's the model? And I try to convince you that this is not just a picture. We have all the, all the parameters of that picture actually mapped from actual longitudinal data. So what actually happens? Okay, let this guy die. Okay, so you are born, you know, nice and pretty, and you are fluctuating, sleeping, not sleeping, partying, okay? So as you grow older, you know, young people can go start partying on Friday and pretend to be working on Monday, okay? Um, unfortunately, as you grow older, your recovery forces decay. I mean, your ability to recover, as you can see, is getting worse. It's harder to recover, you stop partying, but this doesn't help, right? <laughs> okay, so that's about our life. And on the, on the right, you see the trajectory of the biological age, right? So the biological age is fluctuating, and then stochastically, I mean, on a bad day, all the bad things go up in the same way, and you go into the hospital, okay? And then you measure your recovery rate. So as I said, I, can, I cannot make these pictures uh, very long because the longitudinal data is not pretty uh, these days, but of course we are moving towards that dire direction. But that was our ultimate surprise because we were, we were thinking that if humans are exponential agers, we should have exponents in physiological measurements, but we don't. So in fact, we are born like stable animals. So we are almost like happy naked mole rats when we are young. We are fluctuating. Our organism state actually recovers from perturbations. We don't need drugs actually to control hallmarks of aging. Our bodies control hallmarks of aging for us. But then, due to some other thing which is actually aging in humans, not the development of hallmarks of aging, because once again we are immune to hallmarks of aging when we are young. Some other things cause our loss of ability to control um, uh, stability. And then, by chance, some people early, some people later, and then in 12 billion people, a lot more people later, just by chance, will end up uh, alive uh, at about 100 years old. So now, you would tell me what's, I mean, so what? I mean, this is nice aging phenomenology. Can we relate it to something that uh, could be targetable? I still didn't tell you what is the, uh, how do we do drugs against that? So for that, I bring everything to the gold standard, which is the methylation clock, right? Because how you can talk about aging without methylation clock. I have to say that uh, we were the last people on Earth to publish a paper about methylation clock, and I will tell you why, because there was another unpleasant surprise there. So just for those who tried it at home, um, you would know that if you do some kind of cluster analysis on aging features in, in humans, where you are trying to get features that depend on age in similar way, right, some kind of functional systems, you would find that in any age-dependent signal in humans, there would be features that depend linearly on age. I mean, that's why we have clocks. And there will be a lot more features, at least one, that is more than, I mean, even visually, is a nonlinear function of age. I mean, at least two features. In good signals, you can have more which means that you have to have more than one clock, by the way, and that's why we have more than one clock. So the interesting thing is that those features that are kind of hyperbolic, those features increase variance, and their variance actually diverges. One of the variance hits zero at the same 120 years old. As I said, it doesn't matter which biological signal in humans you are measuring. There will be always one system that is failing at about 120 years old. It doesn't matter. I mean, any biological age is measuring that. But the other thing, which is linear, is actually explaining more variance in the data than the other one, than all these quadratic features. But the worst thing there, I mean, really, for those who have read th something about mathematics or stochastic processes, I mean, this is the nightmare scenario. So you have something that is going up linearly with age, and its variance is also going nicely linearly with age. Uh, this normally happens when that something is just a sum of uncorrelated uh, rare uh, events. It's a Poisson noise, by the way, and this can be proven, proven. So really, what you have is that you have complex system that is a human body. And then you have lots of things can, that can exist in white state, which is healthy state, and a black state, which is not healthy state. So we are born, or by just by definition, in the, in the white states. And then, of course, we have lots of things that can go black to white, black to white, as I'm talking and as we're eating, as we're interacting. So these things are soft and we don't care about them. You cannot die from them. And then we have certain things that can go black once in a lifetime, like chronic diseases, diabetes, cancer, and things like that. 
But on top of that, we have a lot more, essentially infinite ma infinitely many more features that are going black less than once in a lifetime. And really tonic features, I mean those, I mean chromatin arrangements, mutations, things that are not allowed to, to be changed, right? They're super protected. The only problem with those features is that there are too many guys who are trying to get black, right? I mean, we have so many copies of those things in our body that some of them accidentally go black. And most of them are benign. I mean, one molecule changed, who cares? One molecule here, one molecule here. But the problem is that most of them are pathological, which means that on average they produce a linear stress on my body, right? So that's why the shape of my body is changing, because somebody is stressing me. So all other measures, like activations of systems that are controlling damage in my body, are reflecting this change, this linear stress. And that's why with age, all those systems are getting activated without apparent reason. They are just, re they are just reading out and uh, measuring the stress, which is produced by all those random factors. So we have the compound effects of infinite number of benign things that has, have no common reason. No common targets, nothing in common, just happening like, you know, in certain amounts, uh, units uh, per time. So together they produce the linear feature, and this linear stress destroys other functional systems to the point when they fail. So one of them fails at about 120, the others are failing later, but since we have lots of noise and fluctuations, you know, some people end up uh, dead from uh, rare diseases in the hospital. The, the punch here is that all of them are going up with age because the regulatory interactions are destroyed by this uh, aging process. This is really bad. I mean, that's why we have been postponing the publication of that paper for so long. I mean, that was the last resort to explain the data. So if this is true, then I have a bunch of statements to make. So first, I, I mean, if what I presented to you is correct, it uh, means that uh, in mice, in short-lived animals, we have lots of hallmarks of aging. Remember, one feature, everything is correlated. You hit one, you produce effects uh, on the others. Uh, there will be infinitely many uh, papers in the coming years that something that is increasing with age, we hit it, uh, the uh, animals are living longer, short treatments produce uh, lasting effects, uh, wow, we have rejuvenation, we extrapolate it to humans and promise them, I don't know, 30, 30 years of life from one shot. So then the same drugs will produce small changes in humans. Why? Because we are already controlling our hallmarks of aging when we are healthy. And those effects will not persist, which means when you stop the treatment, the effects disappear. Uh, two, year, two, two weeks ago, I have just seen another result of a clinical trial in human, by the way, and uh, the result was just this. A drug that worked perfectly in mice produced the change. The change was larger in aged people. In aged people, the effect lasted longer, but it also disappeared. So the key part of human aging is probably not a single process, but many processes that have no common cause or reason, which means it would be very hard to come with a single drug to actually to, you know, unpack all them back, like, you know, put the meat back into the meat grinder. This doesn't work very well. But uh, there are no laws in nature that are telling that uh, you should not be able to revert it, uh, sorry, to stop it. So it's hard to revert, but you should be able to stop it. So when I'm thinking about my personal horizon, I think it's still kind of realistic to invent drugs that would stop it. The problem is that some of you, I think uh, quite some of you who are doing experiments by hands have seen such drugs in mice. The only problem is that they have small effects on lifespan in mice and we're not selecting for them, which is a, which is a problem. So essentially, you can do two kinds of aging research. You can do late-life phenotypes like frailty. You can test your drugs in mice. You will revert aging in mice. You will have small effects in, well, I mean, small. Maybe up to 10 years of uh, health span in humans, as everyone is telling here, this is huge. Lots of money will be earned and everything else. But this is more like squaring the curve, right? So billions of dollars are already deployed there, and we will have drugs like this. I have no doubts about that. They will help people in very bad shape late in life, I mean, almost close to the end. On the other side, there is another uh, phenotype that we call interdynamic aging damage, I mean, true aging. <laughs> uh, it's whole life. It's irreversible, but, I mean, with reasonable technology and uh, probably uh, can only be stopped. But only by acting against that phenotype, which we are not selecting right now in our animal models, you should be able to produce multiple fold uh, expansion of lifespan. And this is the focus of, of our research. Just in one minute, we are taking these millions of electronic medical records. We do these uh, aging models on steroids, like in mice, but now much more sophisticated. So we are trying to capture the health of individual health subsystems in the organism. And then at the same time, we produce estimations of biological age, which is nothing else as the total number of damage in the system. 
We use long longitudinal trajectories in order to self-consistently solve this uh, problem. And these models are outputting the measure of aging, which is the biological age, and then, well, eight seconds. And then we have these uh, activations. Uh, the, we detect systems that are broken, that are associated with clusters of diseases. We do genomics, proteomics on this data. Our models work in such a way that we always have genes that, uh, or factors that are responsible for specific diseases and aging separately. And that's where pharma starts loving you, because pharma actually knows that there is a little bit of aging, at least, that is not reversible in short clinical trials. So that's why they want to see how different molecular factors affect diseases on top of aging. So actually, we found ourselves in the business of regressing out aging from the data, from real-world data for pharma companies, to make sure that they do not develop a drug against aging, for the God's sake. And still have the measures of aging and diseases separately in our data for our own research and for our collaboration. So that brings me to the end of the conversation. We are working with these wonderful people. Uh, we are one of the most aggressive, I think, research, uh, research projects uh, in the field of aging. If you are working in the field of aging, talk to us, find me on social media. We're writing more there. And uh, if you want to support our project, find me on the social media. We would love to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. So I know you're all looking forward to getting out to the bar, but uh, well, let's give Peter a couple of questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. So I understand that damage as a positive factor is compatible with your theory, but what if it were quasi programmed aging or programmed aging? Would that also be, if it's just a partial causal factor, be compatible with your results, or is this not compatible? Or um, did you find out? Yeah, I would say, the, well, thank you for the question, of course. And, uh, uh, for me, the situation uh, with aging in mice looked uh, a lot more like uh, programmed aging than what we see in humans. So I'm, well, I, I will be frank with you, I'm afraid a bit of uh, kind of scholastic discussion here. So for me, uh, well, at least uh, for me to, 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 to look at something like a program, it's beneficial because when it's a program, you can actually handle it so that there should be some handles and uh, triggers of that program or something like that. So with aging in mice, I think we clearly have it. So we have now lots of ways to, to, to activate, deactivate this program essentially at will. So it looks like a program from, let's say, operational definition, not exactly from the exact scientific definition of that. With aging in humans, this damage is really the sum of uh, lots of uncorrelated events. So to me, this is as far away from a program that you know, operationally could be. So for me, it's like this process exists. So evolution has no, you know, sufficient pow selection power to remove it. There are no specific systems to, 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 to stop it. And then, of course, if you have such a wonderful clock in your body that exists anyway, <laughs> I think different biological processes evolutionarily learned how to use this, pro this, this clock to actually adjust certain, to, to, trigger, to use it trigger, as a trigger for certain events. This, this is what I believe. So I believe this, this is really a system clock that is used by the whole body for, for the actual programs, development programs at least, in the body. Any other questions? Yes. But uh, thank you for the fascinating talk. But sh surely, even if you look at, uh, at mice, at the morphology, the morphological development of any multicellular organism, you have first an extremely stable state uh, because you're tending to develop towards a morphology. Like, you know, if you heard, for example, the, the research of Michael Levin, etc., that, uh, in fact, you know, the idea is that there is some attractor in the morphospace to which yes. an organism tends. And then once that stops, then that's where the second law of thermodynamics and essentially the relaxation yes. of the system occurs. So uh, probably the mice as well have uh, it's not just a one-parameter system, it cannot be. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any mice in the world. Yeah, well, uh, well th thank you very much for this question. So, uh, there is a, well, obviously, the system develops into uh, an attractor, uh, which is a point where the, the rates of changes is minimum. But the, this point still may be an unstable equilibrium. So, by direct measurement in mice data, we see that the adult state I mean, if it existed in mice. So the, the mice actually develops into something, almost decelerates almost to zero, but then by noise it's uh, thrown away from that equilibrium position. Sorry? Well, 
Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, the, well, let's say after, let's say after 12 weeks uh, of age in mice, the, this Lyapunov exponent, this instability measure is already fully developed. In humans, it takes uh, more than 50 years to develop the exponent. We actually, we used very large data set to, select, to, to find people who are unstable. I mean, really to plot the, the fraction of people who are dynamically unstable as a function of age. This very small number that is going exponentially with age and doubles every eight, eight years. So for the first 50 years, the number of people who are unstable is very small in the data. So in humans, we have, have very long periods. So very, you know, very well manif manifested attractor, stable equilibrium. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay,